Hello, students. I'm not sure if I've got um, which of you might be logged on yet. We'll be able to see in just a minute. The YouTube link open. No, I better put that where I can look at it. Tonight, we're going to be talking a little bit about your IDSL projects, and um, it'll be an opportunity for asking questions that you might have. And we will also be focused um, on uh, your uh, the delivery system and the management system of the national model. So let me go to the page. If any of you are here in the Hangout, we'll be able to ask questions at any time that it works well for you. You can do it through the live chat. You can do it through the live chat in on the events page. Or you can do it in the Google Hangout if you are, um, are are in the Google Hangout. And if you want to message me if you would like to participate directly in the Google Hangout and through the video feed um, or through just the audio feed, if you'd like to be able to just ask your questions outright, if you'll message me the uh, email address that you use for Google+, Plus, I can add you to the Google Hangout. And so you can be a part of the, the Hangout directly through the video feed or the audio feed, but in live time, synchronous. And we've got the chat as well. So I'm going to post a comment right now that says, if, uh, if you have questions, please feel free to post them in the chat or just ask them outright. Say one more time, please. Uh, send me your uh, Google Plus email address if you. So there are a number of different, of different chat options and a number of different ways you can ask questions. I will try to check all of them. If you see that I've missed one and you have an answer for someone, please, please feel free to answer directly. We are a community of learners and I always ap appreciate um, the students providing feedback for others. Okay, so with your IDSL projects so far, you've uh, been able to accomplish a lot in a brief amount of time. You conducted your um, uh, engagement within the community and in, in the sense that you went out into the community and you completed the cultural and context essay. You had some questions that you talked about with your chamber of commerce or, or a, rep, a similar representative of a comparable agency and have had a chance to ask those questions to learn a little more about the demographics of your community, the culture and the context of your community. And then you have worked with your counselor at this point to determine some ideas of topics that you would be interested in focusing on. So you're moving along. You have an idea of uh, how your community functions, um, what the needs are, and then I hope that you're at this point getting uh, a sense of how you might be able to make a real impact, the difference that you might be able to make for the students in your community and their families, or their families if you've chosen to focus primarily on uh, some work that you want to do with families around career and college readiness. Career and college readiness is a, uh, an area of work for school counselors that has been part of our history for the long term. Now, we do have some new initiatives that are focused very, uh, you know, really shine a spotlight on career and college readiness, or more recent initiatives, I should say, in the last five years, like the Reach Higher uh, initiative that focuses on career and college readiness, and other work that you'll see in the professional literature and part of the just professional conversation around how school counselors function and where we really make a strong impact. And career and college readiness is a very important place for us for that work. So, but it has been a part of our long-term history. This is not a new idea for us. Uh, our profession emerged and as a result of that, um, in part as a result of uh, that focus on preparing people to transition from the military into careers and, and being prepared for that, uh, helping students to be better prepared to be part of a productive workforce, right? So it's an important piece of what we do. Now we do know that we also do a lot of work uh, with the uh, behavioral and emotional issues that children deal with or our students present with. And we do some family work because we have to. You know, the families, our students go home to their families every night. But for your IDSL project, the focus is career and college readiness. 
And with that focus, the focus on career and college readiness, there are a few options for you. There are many, many options, I should say, for you as to how you might want to laser your focus. For some people, that's around financial aid. And um, financial aid, awareness of information, all of that can kind of come under that uh, the broader umbrella of access. So you may want to be focused on how are you going to increase access for the traditionally underserved populations. How are you going to help those different populations that have traditionally had less access to uh, higher education understand what their opportunities are, the resources are available to help them, and, and how they can access those opportunities and resources. Everybody can do that in a pretty unique way, right, for your school and your community. So maybe under the broader umbrella of access, there are some topics that are interesting to you or issues that are interesting to you. Or maybe under the um, umbrella of uh, the process or some of, of applying and admissions, there are some pieces that are really interesting to you. So you might do the FAFSA night. You might come up with a way to engage um, the families and share information about uh, about options or the process or whatever your focus is. There are many, many different ideas out there. So, so far, you've done your work in the community, you learned about the context. You have an idea of this broad area of um, focus, career and college readiness, and within it you're trying to specify, um, uh, to narrow your focus, drill down to the area of, uh, within that that you're most interested in and that best aligns with the needs of your constituent group, of your stakeholders and your students, your school community. Right? And you're going to decide what kind of initiative might you want to develop to address those issues. At this point, you've completed a journal entry, uh, too, and you have had a chance to uh, learn a little bit about the projects that your colleagues are doing. You probably still feel a little overwhelmed. We're at that point in the semester where it can still feel kind of overwhelming because uh, it feels like there's a lot of work still ahead of us and much less time than we had when we started. We all feel that way. Um, but uh, trust me, you are going to get through this, and these steps will continue to unfold, and soon you'll be there. So you've gotten some work started. On, you've gotten the work underway. You've gotten your focus uh, more clear. Your vision is clear, and you're able to start implementing that and, and engaging in those interventions that, or development of um, whatever uh, piece that you think will be helpful to your school community. Um, uh, an area of... Um, there are two areas that we that are often challenges for uh, people in the class. And if anybody has any questions, please, please feel free to stop me, okay? Um, but a couple of areas that are, that are challenging with the IDSL project are the Stakeholders Unite. Like, how do we engage more people? Like, who are the right people for us to engage? Like, how would they, how do they fit with our projects? And what, um, what should we be doing with them? When we think about your topic, then you kind of, so to start with the Stakeholders Unite, Piece. You think about your topic, and then you think, who are all the people, professionals or community resources, that touch the lives of the student or the work of the student around this topic? And who are all the people that might have an impact there? And who are the holders of the information? Because sometimes the holders of the information don't uh, 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 bubble up when we think of the who touches the student's lives, because, the, because there's that gap, right? The challenge for you is to look Look at the gaps and then see how could you build that web of support to support to help the students not fall through into the gap, right? Like not get lost in the gap. Those gaps. So within the gaps, like who are the people that could help your students? Who are the ones that either are the holders of information or the resources or the ones that could reach out to the students and, and be that source of support around this topic that you've focused on? And then how might they engage with you? To produce your product uh, in the production of your idea, bringing your vision to life. Okay. Different people are going to work different ways. So maybe some stakeholder is a holder of information, but that you don't need them directly engaged with the students. But you need them to directly engage with you to share a little information to help you better understand the topic. So if that's the case, include them. Include them in your stakeholders unite piece in your stakeholders unite table. But just note that the strategy or intervention there for that individual is around c consulting with you and helping you better understand, enhancing your understanding of your issue of focus or resources that are available. If another stakeholder has um, this great program that they do around this topic, and you can have them come in and do a classroom counseling session, a classroom guidance session, maybe a parent ed session, 
or maybe they uh, you're going to have them to do something with the teachers as a like a professional development in service. That's great. You can have them deliver that part. That is great because you as the school counselor, you don't have to always create every piece of new programming that you bring to the school. You design it, you plan it, but you may bring someone else in to de deliver a component of it, right? So if somebody else has a program around your topic, or they can come in and do a presentation for your group around your topic, that's fine. That is a great thing to do to help your school community. It's a big asset to have someone who can link resources. You can be that person for your school. List that in the Stakeholders Unite. If you find other pieces, like as you go through and you think, who are the people that touch the, children, the students' lives around this topic? Or who are the holders of the information? Or who are the holders of the resource? Or who are the people that really could fill in that gap that we just haven't thought of before? Be creative and think about reaching out and expanding your network. Because what we know is as a school counselor, when you get in, into your school and you're into the busy work of um, uh, managing the delivery system and the management systems and all the components of your comprehensive program, as you're doing that, it's hard to build your network then. We have to keep strengthening our network, but to try to learn to build a network and start bringing people together and connecting with those different stakeholders and connecting those stakeholder groups to our students to make sure that that flow of resources works really well, that is hard. That can be a real challenge. So this class gives you an opportunity to start that process. And if you start that process now and get a sense of how it works, then you'll be better prepared to do it. At least that's what the research shows us. You'll be better prepared to do it when you enter the field as a school counselor, a practicing school counselor. So the stakeholders unite piece. That piece is sometimes a challenge for people. The other piece that is sometimes a challenge is identifying your data element. So what's, what is going to be the piece that shows you your impact? that helps you understand the impact that your work had on your stakeholder base. What's going to be that piece? That's an important piece. And for many of you, your data element um, could possibly be something, some piece of data that's already being collected uh, by the or area of data that is already being tracked and managed by your um, student information management system at the school. So it could be if there's some, uh, one of the things that uh, is a challenge for students as they try to matriculate to college is if their grades are low or if they've spent less time in school, if truancy has been a concern. So maybe around your college and career readiness, there's some piece that tracks back to truancy or, or absenteeism. If there's a piece that tracks back to absenteeism, then you could use that as, a, as, a, um, as you, the piece that you will use to demonstrate impact. That's totally fine. That's a great piece. If you want to do a survey with people to uh, demonstrate that whatever you did, if you're doing a classroom counseling session or a parent ed session or some community-based uh, programming, and you want to do a, a brief survey that shows what they knew when they came in and what they learned as a result, like what they knew as they were leaving your presentation, so what, what, in, what change there was based upon what you shared with them or resulting from what you shared with them or the conversation that happened in your presentation, that's fine too. That's a uh, good choice. There are many, many choices for the data element, for what you choose to track. And they will be unique to each, um, to each project. But what we know is that for this to matter to principals and administrators in the long term, we've got to show that we're making an impact. So we've got to think about your project, your unique project. And I'm happy to talk with you and your partner, just the two of you, about your project. You know, what data lines up with your project? And how could we, how do we access that? And um, and I guess uh, when we think about impact, like if there are many different options there for you, then which are most access easily accessible? Um, and, and from there, we needed to see what seems to work best for each project. So if you'd like to talk individually about your projects, I would be happy to, um, particularly around that um, impact tracking, because that part is. Um, that, that piece is, uh, sometimes it's, uh, um, it feels further away from who we are as counselors because we get so heavily focused on service delivery and connecting with our students and making sure that we're there doing the work, doing the work, that we don't always track our impact. And, and um, we, we don't always invest the time that's necessary to, uh, to be able to track our impact and share those impacts with uh, administrators and people who can connect additional resources to our, for our, to our programs for our students. 
Okay, so with your IDSL project, you, you're progressing along. You're working through these steps, and you're determining, you know, um, all, all the pieces are, are working together. So at this point, you're at that, that piece where you're planning your intervention. Like, what, um, what are you going to do, and how are you going to implement it? And we're shifting into, you know, that time from right, like right at spring break or a little bit before spring break. Some of you are already implementing your interventions, but for other people, or your plan, like your, what you're going to do, the meat of your project, some of you are doing that now. But for others of you, we want to make sure that uh, shortly after spring break, you've got that underway, that that part's underway. So you'll have time to get your the work part of your project out of the way, and then you can focus on pulling the pieces together for compilation and presentation. Okay. Um, the other thing is the uh, e-poster proposal that's coming up. So for your e-poster, the way that will look, it will be a PowerPoint slide, right? So you've got this template that you create, and it's... Um, it's just like one PowerPoint slide, but it's your whole poster. Because then when you go to present at a professional conference, some of you are doing that right now, actually. Some of you are going to be at NCCA, I think, presenting. Um, and others of you have presented in the past. But what you do is you just print that PowerPoint slide as a poster. And you scale this, uh, the size of it to be the large print poster size. And then it prints out. And so you just tack your poster up. It's a professional presentation, and you're ready to go. So for next year... At the North Carolina School Counselors Association Conference, you'll be able to present this poster if you chose to, the one that you do for this class, because it should be pretty much ready to go. But for your poster proposal, the first proposal, how does that process work? Well, the way the poster proposal process works is the way the proposal process works for um, conference proposals. For the conference proposals, about a year before the conference, sometimes the time frame's a little shorter, a little more brief, but... Um, like the poster proposal for the North Carolina School Counseling one, it's a little more brief. The one for NCCA is a little more brief. But your nationals, and your regionals and your nationals will typically always be about a year out. So say maybe it's smaller, right? Anyway, it, about a year out, you can expect to see that the poster, pro the proposal, uh, conference presentation proposal submission forms become available. And what the proposal submission form is, is your opportunity to pitch your idea to the panel of reviewers for the conference to say, this is what I'd like to present at the conference. But you've got to pitch it like your presentation, that um, brief abstract, it has to look, it has to be written just as it would go directly in the conference bulletin. So even though you haven't done your presentation, that abstract says, uh, during this presentation, participants will blah, 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 or th this presentation includes this and that, whatever the components are, right? So you write your abstract in such a way that it's interesting, it catches the eye and the attention of potential participants, it shares um, briefly what your presentation is about and what people can expect to learn, um, are the resources provided, additional resources provided. It kind of follows that format of like, hey, here is an idea, here is a topic that matters to you, you know, that's discipline specific. Um, this is what you'll learn if you come to my presentation and, and this is how it will go, right? But it's, it's written like it's happening now so that it should be written just like it would be in your conference bulletin and as professional as possible. Um, if you need help with that, if you'd like me to take a look at it, I'm happy to. Um, don't worry, I don't want you to worry about um, making sure that it, I mean, you need to do your very, very best with this assignment, right? And you need to stay in the word limits. That The word limit threshold that's set for, post, for proposals is typically the max. Like you can't go over that number of words or they cut it off afterwards. And that's because they have to fit into certain, um, you know, when you turn in a post uh, presentation proposal, then they're going to take that abstract and put it in the larger bulletin so they know how many pages they're working with. You got an idea of that, right? So the page, the word limits are set. But for you, do the very best you can, and then I will help you to edit that some. When I when I do the grading of it, you'll get feedback from me to edit it some, so that you would be it will be more in line. Hopefully, if any of you have any challenges with it, I, I will do what I can to help you bring it in line with what you would see in um, a conference bulletin, and so you will be prepared to submit it to uh, the North Carolina School Counseling Association if you or if you choose to in the fall. The other piece of the poster proposal form is your bio, the brief bio. The bio for any conference proposal form is provided, required, so that they can see if you have the expertise and the background necessary to provide um, training or uh, discussion about your topic. 
So I, with my particular professional uh, background, would not be able to go out and talk about um, a specific agricultural method, right? That they would read my bio and they say, ah, she is not prepared to do this, or drone use of pesticide application. That I cannot go out and talk about drone use of pesticide application at a professional conference because I don't have the expertise that people would need to be able to learn from me around this topic, right? So in your bio, in your brief bio, link, make it clear to the reviewer how, um, why you would be a credible presenter on your topic, right? So make that, sure that's clear. If you've worked with children in the past and you're presenting about children, you know, you make that linkage for the, in the bio for um, the reviewers. There is uh, some additional information about that assignment in the um, in your uh, Blackboard site, and you can always you can always ask me questions and send me any any questions that you might have about that assignment. I will do my very best to answer them. Uh, with that assignment, with the e-poster proposal, you just submit that e-poster proposal form. You don't you do not have your your poster done at that time, right? Your poster you don't do until after you finish your project. But right now, you're just submitting that poster proposal form. The reason for doing that is to help you be prepared to present pro um, proposals, to turn in proposals for professional conferences, particularly the one that I, I'm hoping you will attend in the fall with the North Carolina School Counselor um, Association Conference. Okay? Okay. And then this week, we are covering the delivery system and the management system uh, from the Ask a National model. You have a PowerPoint. You've got some uh, readings. There's some information in there about responsive services and uh, system level support, different agreements, uh, and uh, some uh, many other pieces of information. One thing you'll see under the management system is the suggestion that you have an advisory council. An advisory council is very helpful. Um, it's helpful in part because they provide you with information to they can help you with evaluating your programming and making sure that you're making good decisions about the programming you're choosing to develop. So they can help you evaluate. And when I say programming, I mean specific elements of your comprehensive program. And you do a lot of different things as a school counselor. So they can help you evaluate those things. They can also help you with the evaluation of your overall, that, that comprehensive program that you've developed. And that they can be, um, provide you with helpful feedback. They're part of your feedback loop, right? The other thing that they do with a good, with a well-planned advisory council, like in terms of the planning, if you're very intentional about who you include on your advisory council, they can help connect you to certain stakeholder groups that you need to have connected to your um, school counseling program. They can help connect you in the community. This is an important part of us, um, of us being able to do our job well, or, or is to be able to be effective at building those webs of support, those networks of support. And your advisory council can help you with that help link you into that larger community, um, professional community, and also that larger or broader community of professionals that serve your uh, stakeholder base, your students. So please make sure that you attend to the information shared in the, in the module covered this week. And if you have questions about your IDSL project as we go along, please feel free to ask them. I have, um, would uh, I am I am happy to try to answer any questions you might have, and um, these projects are ones that usually have some good have legs for you. With the e-poster proposal, I mean the the proposal form is a help because it helps you get ready for the submission to that conference. But the poster itself is uh, quite a big help because you can use it, especially if you handle your title well. If you think about your title from kind of a broad, um, like with a plan in mind from the beginning to try to use that poster at a different at another conference in the future. It can help help you with that. Um, because your poster can just be ready to go. And with the IDSL, uh, the full measure and the report card, you can turn those directly into the administrators. And you should be able to use them also as examples of the way that you manage accountability. Is this, you will manage accountability as a school counselor or accountability efforts you've been engaged in and planning efforts you've been engaged in. Um, in your preparation to become a school counselor, like when you go for job interviews. And uh, it, it will set you apart. Having that information or um, being able to present that you've done to, a, to an administrator or a search uh, committee that you have done this work already and you're prepared to do similar work in your school, that's really sets you apart from candidates who just, um, who, who are only focused on the service delivery. 
service delivery is a major piece of what we do, but evaluating whether or not our services have any impact is critical for schools. Schools are, um, we face resource shortages on all, all fronts, and we have to know that what we're doing matters. And as a school counselor, that measure and, and the measure tool and, and the report card are ways to measure tool and the measure process is a way to assess whether or not uh, the impact that your work is having and whether it matters. And the report card allows you to demonstrate what you found out about your impact to and share that information efficiently and effectively with administrators and other stakeholders to help them understand that your, your program matters too. So I hope you will take it seriously. If anyone is feeling overwhelmed by any components of the, um, the project or any assignments in the class or, or any pieces of it, please let me know. School counseling is a dynamic and, and complex profession. And it's one that, uh, that when you try to, it's one that when you try to teach it in one class, it makes the class feel very overwhelming. But the profession itself, living it day to day, it's pretty invigorating because uh, you get to do so many different things and touch the lives of children and families and community members in so many, many, um, so many ways that have a really a long-term impact. When I'm in the schools, and I'm in the schools pretty regularly, and when I see the work that you and your colleagues are doing, the work that the school counselors are doing and the interns are doing, it is um, amazing to me how much you matter to those students and how much they care about you and how the work you're doing changes how they see themselves and their potential to positively impact society. Uh, that, that's pretty powerful. And though it can feel overwhelming, to try to um, be that person and live that life every day. And it can feel really overwhelming to try to learn about how to be that person and live that life every day. You're gonna do it. You're gonna do it and you're gonna do a good job. And uh, kids and families and communities, they're gonna be different because of you. They're gonna be better and stronger because of you. And they're gonna be more hopeful because of you. Right now, to get to that point, you gotta get through this class. And we can get through it together. And if you have questions about pieces of, of the class, I want to help answer them, okay? I know it's a, there is a lot of reading in this class. There's quite a bit of uh, discussion and assignment. And you're doing a really good job engaging with that so far. And it can, um, you don't have to keep up the pace that much longer. We are almost to midterm. But uh, we're going to get through it together. And if you have questions, if you just let me know, I'll do my best to answer them. If we don't have anyone with questions right now, then um, you can always ask them later too. And I'll be available. All right. Well, it looks like we do not have any questions right now. So I think we will conclude for tonight. And uh, we'll... We, um, like I said, I'm available if you, if you think of questions in the future that you'd like to ask. Thank you.